For this video, I want to prove that the limit of a function exists using an epsilon and delta proof. So, for this limit, I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of 4 minus x is equal to 2. And to prove this using epsilon and delta, we basically have to show the following. We must show that when given an epsilon greater than 0, that there exists a delta greater than 0, such that whenever our x minus 0 is less than delta, it forces the absolute value of the square root of 4 minus x minus 2 to be less than epsilon. Remember, this is just a way of saying that if I choose x values close enough to 0, that it will force my function to be within some epsilon of the value of 2. Now for these, we start with our epsilon side, we work our way backwards to see what we need to make delta. So I've extracted out that part of the definition, and we're basically going to work with this and try and solve it for x. Let's see how it goes. The first thing I'm going to do is break it up uh, because of this absolute value. So I could say negative epsilon is less than the square root of 4 minus x minus 2 is less than positive epsilon. Continuing on, it looks like I can add 2 to both sides. So minus epsilon plus 2 is less than the square root of 4 minus x. That is all less than epsilon plus 2. Alright, so things are looking pretty good. Still need to get a hold of the x. Let's go ahead and uh, square both sides. squared minus 4 minus x epsilon plus 2 squared. All right. Now, since I may be able to combine terms later on, it's probably a good idea to FOIL these out to see exactly what we get. So let's FOIL out this one. Negative epsilon times negative epsilon would be epsilon squared. Let's see. Outside and inside terms would give me a minus 4 epsilon. And my last terms would be a plus Right, doing my other guy. Let's see, epsilon squared plus 4 epsilon plus 4. Alright, we're doing pretty good. Let's go ahead and subtract 4 from all of our parts. All right, almost done. Looks like one of the last things I need to take care of is to multiply everything by a negative 1. Now remember, when you multiply by that negative 1, it will reverse our inequality symbols. All right, it's looking really good. Uh, let's go ahead and just organize everything so we have our smaller terms on the left and our larger terms on the right. So taking this guy, we'll put it over here. I want to say that that is less than an x. And put the other one over there. Okay, perfect. So, when given some sort of epsilon, it looks like I have a good idea of where I need to choose my x. Now, from this, we usually choose our delta. Now, since we're keeping everything nice and general here, we've run into a little bit of a problem. Essentially, we have x inside this interval. And we like to choose delta to be uh, some distance away from x on either side. The only problem is, is I'm not sure whether x is closer to the left end of the interval or the right end of the interval. And if I end up choosing my delta too large, then I might end up actually going outside of that interval. So the question is, how are we going to choose delta so that we don't fall outside of this interval? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my delta, and I'm going to choose it to be the minimum distance of these two. So if I were to make a comparison and say, well, how far is x from this guy and how far is x from this one, I'll take the smallest of those. So x is the minimum. Let's see, how can I figure out how far this is away? Since x is approaching 0, this guy is, is basically at 0. 
So this is some sort of negative number. If I'm describing its distance, I would say that its distance away is just epsilon squared plus 4 epsilon. I basically just multiplied everything through by negative since it is a negative. And for the other one, it's a positive number, so I'll leave it as it is. There we go. So I need to choose delta to be the minimum of these two values. And whichever one turns out to be the smallest, that's the one I'm going to use. Now that we've found delta, the second half of this is basically going through all of our steps in reverse order to show that this choice will actually force our function to be within epsilon of the value of 2. So let's go ahead and see the actual proof. So when given some sort of epsilon greater than 0, I'm going to choose delta to be the minimum of these two things. Let's see how that choice really does package back up and gives us our desired result. So here I have the absolute value of x minus 0 is less than delta, because that's what x is approaching. Well, since I'm making my delta to be the minimum of these two, then I know for sure that it is between these two values. All right, look familiar? Yeah, that was one of our last steps uh, when we were looking for delta. Now, we're going to work with this and try and build um, our function minus 2 as less than epsilon. So let's keep working through our steps backwards and see if we can get there. All right, so one of the first things I need to do is, looks like, get a negative x in here. So let's multiply everything through by a negative. Remember, that flips our signs. Okay, it's good to have our smaller pieces on the left side and our larger ones on the right. So we'll rewrite this. All right, now let's go ahead and add 4 to both sides. Looks great. All right, we can keep going and factor both sides. Remember to check your work to see how we should factor this. So over on the left side, this is a negative epsilon plus 2 squared. And on the other side, epsilon plus 2 squared. Taking the square root of both sides, you can see we've built our function there. And now minus 2 from everything. Looking great. So I have a negative epsilon and an epsilon. Package this guy into our absolute value. And now we have exactly what we want. So this shows that when we made that particular choice of delta, that it forces our function to be within epsilon of the value of 2. So just because of that, we know that the limit as x approaches 0 of our function really does equal 2.